what I want to talk to you about is the return on investment of accessibility. And what I mean by that is that there are, there are many different ways that people think about the accessibility of their websites. But the number one, um, I guess, motivator that seems to come up is the negative motivator. Well, I, I, may be, I may be sued or, you know, I could have a lawsuit or a complaint or something like that. So when you're talking to your companies and when you're building the business case for accessibility, there are other things to talk about, which in fact, from a fiscal perspective, money perspective, far outweigh the risk management that takes case with litigation and complaints. Now, litigation and complaints are still something that you want to avoid. They're still very costly. They're still very time consuming. But what I want to talk to you today is about some different ways to think about that return on investment. And now I can't get the slides to change. Let me try this again. There we go. So what are those return on investment acts, uh, aspects of accessibility and what are some of the things that you can think about when, when you're talking about this with people? Um, and some of these that I'll throw out to you, probably you probably intuitively figured that that was there or you've talked about it before and some maybe you won't. But mainly having an accessible digital presence is gonna have a, a very positive impact across these different items um, that I've collected data on with a lot of research for you. One of them is increasing your market share and gaining e-commerce traffic. So for everyone, we know that, you know, growth is a constant thing and growth in the digital age requires that you have accessibility in your digital products if you want to reach everyone. And for people who think that, oh, if it's not accessible, perhaps I'm losing out on 1% of the market share, um, that's absolutely not the case. The numbers are much, much larger than that. Uh, the second part of that is control and operational costs. So we'll talk about omnichannel organizations. And what do I mean by omnichannel? I mean that in some organizations, you've got multiple ways to do business with them. You can walk into an office. Um, it's something like insurance. You maybe uh, would go talk to an agent. Um, you also may call into a call center. Or you may use their website. Or if you're paying bills, you may mail something in. So I'll give you some examples of why accessibility is important in omnichannel organizations and the goals that they have. And then, of course, we'll talk about managing your risk profile to avoid costly complaints and litigation. Last year, CSUN, I talked about, you know, what some of those costs were, the actual costs, when you add up all of the time that it takes to deal with these things. And so we'll go through that a little bit. And then finally, I want to talk about aligning your digital presence with your company core values. Um, over the last two or three years, we've seen a big emergence of social justice and people wanting to do business with companies that have their values. And people have a choice. Um, so it's also important to do that. So first we'll talk about market share and e-commerce, and I'm just gonna give you some statistics to, um, to point out the amount of money that's, that's up for grabs here, and in fact, how much money you could be missing out on if you're not uh, accessible in your digital channel and that business is going to somebody else. Um, we, did a, we commissioned a study with Nucleus Research, and that's where some of this information came from. The references to the rest of the data are in the slide deck, as Laura said, you'll, you'll get that, and you can see the references and go out and read some of this data for yourself. The first thing I want to talk about is that the amount of, of money involved and the amount of people involved here. So when we think about the, the population of people with disabilities and what this particular study focused in on were working age adults reporting at least one um, disability. And so for them, the total after-tax disposable income um, was approximately $490 billion. So I'll slow down to let that sink in just a minute. Um, 490 billion, so almost half a trillion dollars. Um, and this was in, these are 2018 numbers. I don't have the 2019 numbers yet, but when we get those, I expect it may be a little bit higher. So that's a significant amount of money. Um, and if you're selling and the people with disabilities communities should be people you're selling to or people you're doing business with providing a service, they're going to go someplace else, you know, if they can't reach your website or they can't use your website to achieve whatever they need to do. For comparison's sake, we look at some other market segments that are very close. So the African American market segment is about 501 billion and the Hispanics market segment, $582 billion. Um, so a huge market segment um, overlooked, I'll say, way too frequently. I think uh, Preeti put it best this morning. She said the, the apartheid of, uh, of online e-commerce is you know, leaving people out on purpose when we could do something about it. But you can see that this group, you know, definitely has that economic pull. And that's why you're seeing more and more companies move towards providing accessibility and looking for solutions. 
20 million, this is 35% of all the people um, with disabilities in US working age adults, 16 to 64 years old. So again, we're focusing on working age people because we're talking about you know, people who are going to have money and spend money here, but 20 million, just a, a huge number when you think about the overall population of the United States. And again, this does focus on the United States. I don't have uh, statistics like this that are available worldwide. Um, and so for the United States, um, we get this from um, the IRS and different data sources. Again, you can see them referenced in this source. And this comes from a hidden market, the purchasing power of working age adults with disabilities that was published back in April of 2018. So quantifying a little bit about who is involved here. So, so what type of disabilities um, are out there or showed up in this study uh, sample section? And this chart that I'm bringing up now shows you the different amounts of money in different disability categories. So for vision difficulty, we've got approximately uh, 40 billion. For hearing difficulty, um, over 80 billion. Self-care difficulty, around 5 billion. Uh, ambulatory difficulty, over 100 billion. Cognitive difficulty, about 100 billion. And then independent living difficulty is the largest category with about $140 billion. So, Thinking about your products and who can use your products and, and who may be trying to use your website, this will give you an idea of why accessibility and why with CAG is so important because it really is spread all the way across in terms of the things that you have to provide for people who may interact with your website differently, either through a screen reader or some type of assistive technology. So very important to understand that this market segment includes all of those types of people. Now let's talk about e-commerce um, specifically for a moment. So e-commerce revenues in North America totaled approximately 517 billion in 2018. And again, when I have the 2018 numbers, we'll, we'll try to do this um, to see kind of where things shake out you know, year over year. But that's 10.3 billion e-commerce market size for accessibility. And again, I'm, I'm just looking back at the e-commerce and the statistics and, and um, within the reports, you can find these as well. So based on the research that was done, 2% of total e-commerce transactions are completed by people who are blind. In this study, it focused heavily on the, the people who are blind community. Now this is, this is back over to um, the other study that I referenced that we commissioned. But with that 2% coming out, we can see that a total available market here would be about 10.3 billion. So if you're looking at a $10.3 billion market, uh, to put that in context, um, Home Depot reported a $6.94 billion of market revenues in 2018. So the difference between these two is really coming out to that, that $6.9 billion that companies are missing out on if they're not tuned in to the specific market. Um, now, why are these numbers so important? These numbers are important because as you work on accessibility to your company, it's not a cheap thing to do. It's getting cheaper and it's getting easier and you can create very efficient, sustainable programs um, as you work on it, as you mature. But you're going to have to have money to be able to do this. And if we talk about, you know, perhaps lawsuits that set, are settled for $30,000 or $40,000, uh, people don't get too excited. When you talk about losing out on $6.9 billion or basically a Home Depot's worth of e-commerce, things become a little more exciting, especially for those folks who are looking out for your company's bottom line. According to the same research, more than 70% of the internet sites that they looked at had some type of critical accessibility blocker. Now that is an incredibly high number. And, and the quote on this one this morning from Preeti was, the internet is not available, uh, which, which comes from that study again. But 70%, 70% of sites had something that was going to block someone from using that site to achieve what they wanted to do. Just an incredibly high number. Um, inaccessible e-commerce retailers, again, losing out on $6.9 billion annually, which is just up for grabs. So if your competitors are working on accessibility and you're not, then they're going to get um, some of that, that 6.9 billion that's out there. And customers don't simply abandon a purchase. And if you've ever been to the grocery store lately, I can stand in front of the bread aisle or the soup aisle, or whatever. There, there are a billion different choices. And it's that way in the digital world as well. You aren't locked down to just a single thing that you can shop for. Now you have all the different choices that come not only with the product, but the after sales service and the other things that people expect. Um, and so if they can't buy from you, then I would say, oh, well, I guess I'm not going to get a cell phone today. They're going to go someplace where they can get a cell phone or they can get cell coverage um, and call coverage. So it's, it's, it's going to happen. The question is, will it happen 
with you. So now I'm going to move on to operational costs uh, for a little bit. And so this is where I talked about omnichannel organizations. And in an omnichannel organization, we are going to have different ways to interact with the company. And I'm going to use an example here. And this is an example of a company um, that has four different channels to make a payment. You can walk in, which is a brick and mortar staffed agent facility, costs $15 for them to process a payment when you walk in to do it. Because we take everything into account, including the real estate, heating, cooling, electricity, the whole bit. When you call in to make a payment, it costs $7.50. We're in a brick and mortar staffed call center. There are people there, there are computers there. <clears throat> Again, it's another building that we have to account for. It's quite a bit cheaper than going into the agent facility, but it still has costs associated with it. If you mail in another brick and mortar facility, a staffed mail processing center, I don't know if any of you have ever been to a mail processing center that can process millions of you know, letters per hour and payments and take the checks out and get them to where they need to be and deposit them, but it's a fairly large complex uh, operation, lots of moving parts, still cheaper than walk in and call in at $2.50. Click in is really where the money's at. You got a virtual digital website transaction. It still costs money because we're moving money. We have to use infrastructure to do that, but it's more along the lines of 50 cents. Um, so walk into an agent's office, $15, virtual, digital website transaction, 50 cents, um, $14.50 savings to have them use a digital channel. We know that this is an important thing to companies because you're being bribed all the time to use a digital channel. I, I'm sure that all of you have received these pleas from your company, you know, if you'll go paperless, I'll give you $5 a month off of your service. Or if you will let me uh, use ACH to take a payment from you, you know, I'll give you, you know, you'll get 10% off of whatever happening. So we know if the companies are giving you that money back, that they're making more money than that off of the change. So this becomes very important. I think a good example of this lately is, uh, and I think they still do it, but at the time that I, that I originally wrote this, Verizon, you could go get a new line with Verizon. If you did that over the internet and had to mail the phone to you, it was, I believe, $20 activation fee. If you went into an actual Verizon store, which would be the full service, it was a $40 activation fee. So $40, $20, who doesn't want to pay 50% less or $20 to activate their phone? Well, everybody does. The other problem you run into with that is that if you are offering that type of discount in your digital channel, it's not available, you've got an issue, right? You either have to make somebody whole by offering them the same thing if your digital channel is not accessible, or you've got to fix a digital channel so that people can, can operate there. So in the example that we're gonna run through, um, it's critical to push work to that digital channel for all those reasons that we just discussed. In the channel mix that we want versus the one that we have for make a payment, I'm gonna say that the walk-in traffic, our target is 5%. That's our most expensive channel. We really don't want that used unless it's for very complex transactions, but the actual is probably more like 60%. For call-in, the target is 15%, where the actual is more like 20%. For mail-in, the target is 20%, where the actual is more like 15%. And for click-in, the target is 60%, where the actual is more like 5%. So, you know, target, which is what we want, um, which is the smallest amount of transactions in the most, in the least expensive channel and the most in the most expensive channel, or I'm sorry, reverse that, the smallest and the most expensive and the most and the least expensive. And then the actual, what we have, which is probably that our most expensive channel is still being used. So to calculate what this difference could mean, I'm going to look at this company that has this mix um, that I just read to you, looking across the channels for 1.5 million payments a month. Now, if you think about 1.5 million payments a month, I try to keep these numbers realistic, but 1.5 million payments a month to some companies, some Fortune 50 companies, could be more like 1.5 million payments in a day. Um, or sometimes, you know, 1.5 million payments in an hour. But we'll just say that right now, it's 1.5 million payments per month. So what we generate across the actual distribution on those channels, walk-in is gonna cost us 13.5 million, call-in is gonna cost us 2.25 million, mail-in is gonna cost us 562,000, and click-in is gonna cost us 37,500. So in one month across those four channels for 1.5 million payments, I'm going to spend about $16.35 million to handle those transactions. 
um, if I move some of that traffic, so say my problem with the click-in channel here, it's the actual is only 5% in this case, is that it's not accessible. So say I do make it accessible to the people who need accessibility to operate in that channel, and, but let's not get crazy and say that everybody would suddenly start using that channel if it was accessible. Let's just say that a portion of people would start using that channel. So what I've done here is I've just removed 3.33% from the walk-in, call-in, and mail-in channels, and I've added that 10% to the click-in channel. So again, trying to be conservative with the numbers and saying we're not going to see this huge increase just because click-in is suddenly accessible, but we might. So this would probably be what I would consider your worst case boost. So under this scenario, walk-in has 12.757 million, call-in has 1.878 million, mail-in has 438,000, and click-in now costs 112,000. But when we add all those up due to the vast differences between doing uh, or, or uh, running that transaction in each channel, we now see the total cost to payment processing for all channels per month was 15 million or 15.187 million dollars approximately. So what does that mean to our business by adding another five, another 10%? So again, we were at 5% click in, now we're at 15% click in. Just by moving 10% more people to the digital channel, we've saved ourselves 1.162 million dollars a month. Now, if we look over an entire year of 1.5 million transactions each month, which again is probably conservative, we've saved ourselves $13.95 million. If you're in an omnichannel organization and you're trying to make a case to get money to help your organization become accessible, who couldn't run a very well-run and very mature program for $13.9 million, almost $14 million a month? You know, we all probably could. We all should be able to. It'll probably be a lot less than that. So what you're gonna be able to show is that if you are truly able to increase that channel, by 10% or even 7% or even 5%, it's probably the savings there is probably gonna eclipse the total cost per year of your accessibility program. So basically you're self-funding through your results. A very interesting business case to give the numbers people. Again, your upper echelon in your company, you'd probably be very interested about how things are running um, and what they're trying to do here, you know, in terms of the bottom line. Um, so definitely something that you might want to look at if you've got that business intelligence number or the data from your channels, you can create some of these same numbers using those costs per transaction and using the channel mix for your company. Another tidbit out of the research um, related to channels. So internet users who are blind call a company's customer service department once a week on average because of website inaccessibility. So they're calling in that call, channel, uh, call center channel Hopefully you've got a specific place for people with accessibility issues to go, but unfortunately that's not the case in most cases. 90% um, of them reported that they're calling customer service multiple times to report an issue, even though they've abandoned the transaction. So you can see the, the leakage that you have in that particular channel and probably in some of your other channels too. Um, people, they haven't purchased your product, but they're still upset that they couldn't and they're calling that call center. So you're still running costs through their um, even though they couldn't do what they wanted to do and perhaps even they've you know purchased from someplace else and again this is the report the internet is unavailable by nucleus research which was commissioned by dq so we'll talk about risk management yet next so this is the third the third pillar of return on investment um, that i speak about and risk management again really comes down to complaints and lawsuits and brand value so what happens you know when you've got some type of complaint or you've got a lawsuit um, what happens when you're dominoes and you take your case up to the Supreme Court, right? I mean, there's there's different things that occur and none of them are very good. And and uh, obviously this takes a lot of time and focus away from your company to have to deal with these types of things. Now, very quickly, because I think there's 15 presentations and we talked about this morning, I'm going to do a quick lawsuit uh, recap. Uh, the source for this is Usable Net. They do a great job of collecting this data every year. So I want to make sure and give them the shout outs, you can go check out their uh, recap of the lawsuits for 2020. Um, but some interesting things showing up. So um, last year for 2018, we were able to say, you know, there was a huge exponential increase. This year you can see there were 2,235 cases. And I think this data was near the end of December. So maybe like December 16th 
Um, but there was a little bit of a hold that happened during that Domino's case. Um, one of the things we did notice, though, is that the file cases have reached a one an hour rate in 2018 and is holding in 2019. So once an hour, we're seeing a case get filed. If Basically, if you're not accessible and you haven't had a lawsuit yet, you're very likely to have a lawsuit. Um, so the numbers continue to increase. Uh, one of the more uh, startling things that popped out here, too, is the, the, the repeat suits that we're seeing. So out of the, the 2,235 total that were sued in 2019, 21% of those were sued multiple times. Remember, um, as Pretty talked about this morning, if you caught that her presentation, there's nothing that absolutely keeps you from being sued. There's nothing that keeps you from being sued by the same law firm, maybe not even by the same individual, unless you've settled with them and come to some agreement that they can't do that. So um, if, you've, if you've become a target, you're likely to remain a target until you correct those issues that are causing you to be a target, which means you need to add accessibility into the requirements for your website. And also, um, it's still across a wide swath of industries, retail, food service, entertainment and leisure, travel and hospitality, self-service, and real estate agencies and properties. Um, this just shows you where the current targets at are. Um, a combination of, of real lawsuits and lawsuits that I'll call maybe uh, predatory lawsuits. These are the ones where the lawyers are looking to get some type of quick settlement out of it. Um, they tend to do these in batches. So you'll see them hit a whole bunch of retail all in the same space. or there are a whole bunch of food service all in the same space in the same area. But it is across all industries right now. So let's talk about the potential cost of these accessibility complaints. What's it really going to cost me if I get a complaint? And the way I did this, this is anonymized Fortune 500 data across several different use cases. So these are real numbers. These are real things that happen and occur in companies when they receive a complaint. And in a minute, we'll look and see what happens and occurs when uh, companies receive a lawsuit. So to calculate this, and, and this was a big, big uh, topic of discussion last year with the blended hourly rates that I use in this. These are just for illustration. So if you look at the blended hourly rate of the people in your company and say $120 is way high, then use the, the, the uh, data structure I have here and put $80 an hour in. If you say it's too low, put $200 an hour in. The point is just to give you an overall feel for the activities that take place and how much those can actually cost. So at a blended rate of 120 in this, this fictitious company that's based on real life, uh, people that had to participate in the complaint were call center personnel, call center management, compliance and regulatory people, product management, developers, QA testing, deployment and operations, because theoretically you're going to take the call and then you're going to actually do something about it. When we look at the activity, what happens there, this is how it works out. And we're just looking at the actions that have to take place, the number of participants that uh, we have in the action, how many hours for participant and the total hours and extended cost. Um, now, I'm not going to read the whole chart to you. I'll read a few of them so you can get an idea. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll cover the actions um, down the side there. But in the action column, we've got somebody has to, you know, they're going to receive the complaint. Uh, hopefully, somebody is accommodating it. So in that cell phone um, Example I used a little bit earlier, if somebody called in and said, hey, I, I had to go into the office because your website's not accessible. They charged me $40. Hopefully, if they call in, you say, oh, I'm so sorry that you couldn't get through the website. I'll credit you $20 and give it right back, right? This is an important, very, very, very important part of any complaint is to let them know that you hear them, you are listening, that you care, and fix whatever it is. If they missed a coupon, if something cost them more because they did it in a different channel, Make sure that that's taken care of and you may avoid a lawsuit. Um, somebody's going to have to document the issue. They're going to have to process it. We're going to have to spool up some type of a project to fix it because it is an actual accessibility issue that has to be repaired in the content. And then we've got to do all the standard software development lifecycle um, activities, design, code, QA. You have a production issuance. Then you'll have to spool down the project and then hopefully follow up with the customer. So that customer in the cell phone example you could, you know, call them back at some point and say, hey, I really appreciate you you hanging with us, and I'm glad the $20 uh, that I credited you helped you. Um, by the way, we fixed the website. So if you want to add a line for one of the other members of your family, you can now do that on a website. We really appreciate you, um, you know, pointing this out to us so we can get it fixed. So 
the right way to handle these things. But when you add all these up, again, looking at the $120 per hour rate, it becomes expensive very quickly. Now this scale factor design versus product effect, um, IBM put out a study a long time ago that said it could be up to 100% more, 100 times more expensive to fix something in production than it would be to fix it when it was originally built. Um, now, is it always 100 times? It's not always, but again, you can play with these numbers if you want to as well. Even if it's 50 times more expensive, that's an incredible uh, increase in expenses. So the proactive fixed cost here would have been $100.50. And so we're just looking again across these case studies. If I had found, let's say that the design issue was, or let's say that the issue was introduced in design. It was a design markup and escaped all the way out to production. If I would have caught that in a design review and fixed it, it probably would have cost me only $100, a portion of an hour, right, to fix it um, so that the developer got it right. If I let it get all the way out to production and the 100 times scale factor is correct, that would actually be more like $10,000. But even if it was 10, even if it was 50%, let's say it would be 5,000. But for this, for this model, I used the 100X, um, so $10,000. So if you had 100 complaints a year that you had to go out and fix in this disruptive manner of starting up a project and helping out the customer and then circling back with the customer, all the things that we talked about that you had to do um, back on this chart, that would equal about a million dollars. And so again, 100 complaints over a year, you spend a million dollars handing in complaints, what could you have done with a million dollars inside of an accessibility program or inside of your SDLC with testing and tooling and things like that? Likely a lot. So even small complaints that seem small in the aggregate can add up very quickly. And we do see companies with this level of complaints. We see companies with multiple lawsuits at any one given time too. So I'm gonna segue now into the lawsuits. So when we have a lawsuit, things get a little more expensive and again please don't fo focus on the blended rate i've got 225 dollars an hour here i had three um three lawyers come to me right after i presented this last time and said that's way low okay well if it's low let's make it 500 or whatever but for all our, our law firm you know you've got a deal we'll say it's 225 dollars an hour blended between everybody who's going to participate and the legal folks but it's also going to involve different people in your company in this case you're going to need senior company leadership. So if you have a lawsuit, somebody's going to want to know about that. What's the aggregate risk to my company at the C-level? I want to know those things. You're going to have compliance and regulatory personnel. Uh, you're going to have internal legal counsel, internal legal support. You're going to have some subject matter experts from inside of your company. You're probably also going to have some external subject matter experts as, as well as some type of law firm to advise your legal folks on this. They're probably not going to be uh, you know, incredibly gifted in this area of lawsuits about accessibility. So they're going to have to get some type of, of help outside. And then obviously your centralized team will be engaged and you have to do all the SDLC things you did before because you still have to fix it. But then now, because you have potential brand damage and other things that come out of this, you could have deployments and operations and marketing involved as well. So the lawsuits requiring new and more expensive resources, it's gonna demand a protracted response. These things do not get done quickly. Um, everybody loves to get a, get a continuance in court and continue on while they talk about things. Um, it's gonna involve those senior levels of your company and your aggregate risk, and generally it's gonna call for that outside counsel that I talked about. So let's look real quickly at what are the things that occur inside of a lawsuit. Well, um, some of the things are similar to before, um, but there's some new things. So the lawyers are going to have to be assigned and the business is going to have to be notified. You're going to retain an outside counsel. And I've listed a retainer here of 150000 which I was also told was very low. But again, we'll just use it for the math and the example. Um, you're going to have to have communication to everybody involved, including those senior leaders. Uh, and you're going to have hold order processing. So I don't know if any of you have participated in lawsuits before, but when a lawsuit happens, typically um, a company is going to issue a hold order. So any type of email or documentation, project documentations you have related to accessibility for an accessibility lawsuit is going to be discoverable. So you've got to hold it. That means you can't destroy it on regular retention deadlines. And there's things that each person has to do. So 45 people in this instance are going to have to do some type of hold order processing. Your outside counsel is going to want to see your documents. So you're going to have to get it to the outside counsel. 
you may have initial discovery ordered by a judge. This does happen in some of the jurisdictions where very early in this process, they say, well, let's do a little initial discovery and, you know, send anything that supports your answers to this lawsuit so that I can take a look at it and see where we stand. Um, now you're going to have, you know, the things that the lawyers do, status meetings, you're going to have prep for court status hearings, prep for negotiation, negotiation itself. And then we come back to the settlement itself. So we're going to have a settlement draft, the settlement draft review, the finalization, the processing. Then you're going to have to release the hold order on all those records that you held before. And finally, you're going to close the project file and document not to mention the fact that you're also probably going to have a project that is fixing or doing the things that the settlement to the lawsuit demanded. Lawsuits, settlements demand a lot of things. They may say you have to train all your call center people. They may say you have to institute a policy. You may have to, fire, you may have to hire a chief accessibility officer. Uh, you may have to provide VPATs for the major functionality in your website. So <clears throat> those things that I just talked about are not included in this total. Uh, litigation grand total from all that activity that I just talked about, again, from this chart to that chart, $356,000. So in this particular example, or the aggregate for these examples, this was a lawsuit that was settled very quickly and for a very low amount of money. So somewhere somebody said, oh, you know, I settled the lawsuit for $30,000. You know, we could do this all day long. Not a big deal. Well, this doesn't include the settlement. So let's add 30,000 to that and let that person know that it actually costs you $386,000. And by the way, you disrupted your company. And by the way, you disrupted your ability to provide more functionality on your website because you're focusing on the accessibility, the non-functional part. And by the way, you've risked the brand name of your company. So a lot of, of tangible things in here and tangible dollars you can look at, but a lot of intangibles, that you may not feel immediately may come up down the road as well. So lawsuits, complaints, definitely something to avoid. If you need some hard figures of what those things actually cost or a way to estimate this inside your organization, I urge you to use these charts. You may have slightly different um, activities, you know, put those in there and do some estimates. Use this method to build that business case and say, you know, if I'm accessible and I avoid a lawsuit, I probably avoided somewhere in the nature of 300 to 400 to $500,000 in activity for the company. So the last thing I wanna talk about in terms of a, of a return on investment uh, pillar is alignment with core values. So we all know that accessibility is just the right thing to do. In fact, a lot of people know it, even though they don't know what accessibility is, inclusiveness is the right thing to do. Diversity and inclusive have been on people's radars forever. Um, Pretty also talked about the study that said um, there's usually somebody assigned, I think, from a diversity and inclusiveness standpoint, but accessibility tends to be an orphan in companies. So even though we know it's the right thing to do, nobody's necessarily designated that responsibility or accountability to do it. And so it suffers uh, for that reason. So when I say the right thing to do, let's put that in perspective. So uh, recognize the company here. So these are some company logos that I just picked out. And the answers to which company is which are in the speaker notes uh, when you get it. I'm not going to talk about them here, but um, look at some of the things that, that we put out there um, as companies. So we're here to help life go right. You're in good hands with, I know some of you are probably guessing some of these, <laughs> life is better when we're connected. Um, our clients' interests always come first. That's a big one. Leading the way. You know, how can you lead the way if you're not accessible? which is the way of the future. Uh, when there's a helpful smile in every aisle, unless that aisle happens to be the digital website where you're ordering things and having people bring it out to your car because of the virus. Um, or our vision is to be, this is one of my favorites, our vision is to be Earth's most customer-centric company. That is a heck of a statement. Um, and the last one, be what's next. So for all of this, I say, if your mission is to be inclusive and connected, customer driven, simple, helpful, and customer centric, how can accessibility not be a part of that? It must be a part of that. And you must align to those core values and make sure you're supporting it. So, you know, how do you monetize this? How do you turn this into return on investment? Well, I would suggest that you get with your marketing folks and get with your diversity inclusion folks, get with um, your, your chief um, compliance officer and say, this has to be a part of the things we do in today's digital world. 
I added this quote in here because I thought it was pretty interesting. I don't know if we'll see this again since the market has crashed. Uh, in the Washington Post, uh, on August 19, 2019, um, the headline was a group of top CEOs say maximizing shareholder profits no longer can be the primary goal of corporations. So I, I know those of you who can see me, uh, on the camera, you can see that I'm smiling. You probably hear my voice too. Um, but I just picked this up because in my entire life, that's the first time I've ever heard anybody say that. But if these CEOs are, are being true to that fact, then what they're saying here is that we have to think about the people. We have to think about our customers. We have to think about our employees. And we have to think about all of our customers and all of our employees. And that means that some of them are going to have disabilities and they're going to need accommodations and they're going to need accessibility. So let's really put our money where our mouth is and do this if this is what people say they want to do. And I encourage you to go out to check out that, that uh, post. It should still be out on WashingtonPost.com. And then, of course, social justice causes are on the rise. So we've seen tech companies facing pushback. Uh, against contracts with immigration and border control agencies. You know, and this was in the news towards the end of last year. Uh, we've seen retailers face calls to halt firearm sales. This happens every time there's a mass shooting. And increasingly vocal calls on social issues like racism, LGBTQ plus equality, people with disabilities equality, ageism, you name it. The younger generation in this, in this country is really tuned in to equality and really tuned into inclusiveness. And I'm not saying that the older generations don't care. I'm just saying that because this younger generation tends to do things in digital channel, we're seeing pressures there we, that we didn't necessarily see from consumers, you know, 10 years ago. So you, you absolutely must take that into account and it must be part of your business planning if you want to be successful um, in the digital channel. And then finally, Customers are increasingly looking to spend money with companies that share their views. Um, and we even see customers who are willing to pay more for something if it's done in an inclusive manner, if it's done in a sustainable manner. Um, probably all of us have paid a little bit more money for something because it was done, uh, created sustainable. Maybe you've got an electric car because, you know, you're trying to help the environment and global warming. Uh, so, these things really make a difference now and people are willing to spend a little extra money to get services for a company they really believe in and a company that feels like they will treat everyone like they need to be treated. And so with that, I've left a little time for questions here at the end. Great, great job, Greg. Um, really great presentation so far. So yeah, if you have questions, please put those into the chat or Q&A. I'm gonna start out here um, with some questions that people already posted. So the first one I have says, uh, what approach would you recommend um, in order to implement accessibility to those who have already developed a website? Should we start development again? Hmm. No, you shouldn't start development again. Um, so this is, this is, you know, people, what's, what's the example here? I think it's the blueberries, right? If you're making blueberry muffins, bake the muffin and then try to put the blueberries in afterwards. It's very difficult to do. Right. And so that's what you, so you're saying your, your muffin is baked and the blueberries are still sitting over here someplace. There are ways to minimize the impact of that and immediately going out and saying, I'm going to, you know, rewrite my entire digital presence. I'm going to, you know, impact everything while I do this is probably not a good idea. What you should look for are inflection points where you have an opportunity to do that. So, as you're rebranding things or as you're upgrading things, um, you should add it in um, in an iterative fashion versus this this big replace. Now, one of the things you can do if you're not accessible now while you're doing that is be very public with what you're trying to do. So have a public facing accessibility statement that says we are committed to accessibility. These are the steps we are taking. This is our timeline for trying to achieve X, Y, Z. Um, and if you're focusing on things to fix, I would try to use something like Axe Core um, to get Axe clean, right? If you can fix all the automated issues, you could get yourself, you know, 40, 50%. And if you're using Axe Pro, maybe 60, 70% of the way clean, uh, depending on how your websites are written. So I, I wouldn't recommend just that total replace. I would look for different points where you can come in there and do that. I've done a total replace. I'm a veteran of that. And I will tell you, it was a very difficult and disruptive activity. It was driven by uh, legislation, um, not in the United States, but up in Canada, but it was a difficult thing. I wouldn't do it that way again. So hopefully that answered your question. 
Great, thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. Another question here. Uh, what's the best way to calculate the cost of starting an accessibility initiative um, for a business case? The best way to calculate the cost of starting the initiative? Uh, I don't know if there's enough data in that question for me to, to let me just let me just take a shot at it though. So if you're starting an initiative, you should think about things like, so I would recommend to people, if you, if you do only two things and you do them tomorrow to start out, first figure out a way to get some type of automated testing into your SDLC and second, create a public facing statement so that people know that you're focusing on those things. So in laying down an initial budget for something like this, I would probably look at um, the resources that people will need. So I think about developers and I think about really, you know, several things that developers need to do their job. One is they need to have the uh, requirement to do it. So there has to be some type of policy driving it. Second, they have to have the time and time is most important because already most of the developers you're gonna talk to don't have time. The third one is they have to have knowledge. So you have to have some type of educational plan in place. The fourth one is they're gonna have to have some type of tooling, hopefully automation. Um, and then finally, the fifth one is some type of subject matter expert to talk to when they get stuck because they will get stuck. So think about your development group and what they need. You design a development group, focus there, and then add in the number of resources you would need to do that to start out on a small group. Again, don't try to get every developer in your company doing this at once unless you only have 10 developers in the company, in which case you could. Um, but just target a normal size, figure out your FTEs there, figure out what your tooling budget is. If your tooling budget is zero, you've always got acts out there that you can get started with. Um, and yeah, I would, I would go at it that way. Also think about organizational change management. You're going to want people to understand accessibility, accommodation, and disability so that they know why we're doing this and they can put some thought process behind why it's important and why we're spending time on it. So hopefully that, that helped. That was a very broad question. Great. Thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. Another question here. Um, this question says, you know, this presentation was great. It was geared towards large uh, enterprise organizations, uh, which is good for a benchmark. But uh, are you seeing, um, what are you seeing to SMBs who don't typically have the same type of infrastructure? By SMBs, I mean small business? I believe so. Probably. Um, so, Yes, a little bit, but, but if you think about, so from a small business and the different channels a small business might have. So maybe a small business, you've got a shop and you've got your e-commerce side. Think about the expenses, how vastly different those are between your shop and your e-commerce side as you do things, even when you count the infrastructures you put together. So I think for a smaller business, some of those business cases, especially probably the social justice one, and the omni-channel one, considering that almost all businesses have at least two channels now, are gonna play very well in that small business justification to say, this makes even more of a difference than us, to us than it does to this large corporation who can handle you know, these additional costs of taking a payment or something like that. You're, you're always trying to, you know, using QuickBooks, trying to figure out some way to reduce your costs. This is a way to reduce your costs if you've got that digital channel um, in play. So. Anytime you can use the digital channel and avoid having to have your limited um, resources, which are your people, you know, doing those transactions, you're going to, you're going to come out on top. Great. Thanks, Greg. Mm -hmm. Another question here. Um, it sounds like the budget for accessibility investment has multiple stakeholders. Based on your experience, do you have any examples of how that has worked for other companies? Are there any uh, primary use cases you could share? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, so the budget question, the first answer to is that nobody wants it, right? Nobody wants to say, I'm going to take a portion of my budget and put it forward for this. The IT organization doesn't want to do it. The compliance organization doesn't want to do it. Nobody wants to do it. Um, I've seen it done a few different ways. So I've seen where the budget has been centralized. And so I put my budget in the center and then I allocate those budget out, allocate budget out to the other teams to help pay for things that they have to do because of accessibility. That is probably the, the easiest to track and the most effective one I've seen because you take away the argument that, oh, you're using my budget to do this, right? So there's that centralized funding model. The other way I've seen uh, people do it is they have funding models where perhaps um, all of the departments kick in or the departments kick in based on you know, what their piece of the pie is. We already should know 
how much e-commerce costs for their portion of the business. And sometimes they'll allocate it out as a business cost. Uh, other times I've seen organizations just come in from a compliance perspective and say, this is, you know, what you have to do, you're going to do it and it's unfunded mandate. So I think I, I mentally put those in the order of best might work and probably won't work <laughs> for you for the three there. So unfunded mandate probably won't work. Uh, having it, having it part of each business's individual cost is difficult. Centralized funding being the best model because it does, again, it takes some of that, takes some of that argument. Um, a way that people typically will have when they when you're asking them to do something. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Elizabeth's asking, uh, when making a public facing statement set you up for a potential lawsuit since um, you are saying that you're just beginning this initiative? It depends on how you write your public facing statement. So, um, and this would be a long conversation too, but I'd love to talk to anybody who wants to talk about it. And you, you know, you'll have our contact information in here. The important thing is to let, again, like I said, people know that you care, that you're allocating money toward it and you're doing things. In the end, if you get one of those predatory lawsuits that comes in, um, that's the public facing statements not going to affect it one way or the other. If you have somebody who's trying to do something on your website, one of the first things accessibility issues is they'll just do a control F or they'll do find in the browser and they'll look for accessibility. If you have in your, on that page, in the footer or the header or wherever, probably in the footer, accessibility that they can select and go to to get your public facing statement as well as um, perhaps a form to fill out or somebody to call, all this stuff has to be accessible by the way, or somebody to call or some way to reach the company and get help, that goes a long way towards making people think you care and they're not necessarily going to jump right to that lawsuit issue. So it's a difference between fighting the uh, predatory lawsuits and uh, trying to respond to real customer needs in those real lawsuits. And in the predatory, I'll say that I haven't seen that make a big difference, but you don't want to go out there and write a statement that says, we're not accessible at all right now, but we want to be uh, with nothing else. Right. So, I mean, that would certainly probably attract attention. So, there are ways to do that. You talk about your forward progress, talk about what you're trying to focus on in a non-specific manner. That gets more of that information across to people. Because again, what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to respond to people through those statements when they're having issues and how you respond makes all the difference. Perfect, thanks Greg. Mm -hmm. uh, another question here, is there generally um, an accepted percentage of project cost for accessibility? For example, if I'm uh, proposing an accessibility initiative to leadership, can I say it will add a 10% or 20% um, to the project cost? Yeah, so the generally accepted percentage is zero um, if you're the scrum master right, or, the project, or the product owner. Um, but I'll tell you what the actual experience is. So in my experience, um, and I'll just say the percentage hit in the software development life cycle, so this is across the whole thing. Initially, and this is that uh, somebody asked a question about would you just go in and replace the whole thing? This was in that very disruptive, all of a sudden replace things, um, you know, short duration, nine month effort. It was using 10 to maybe even 15% of the software development life cycle. Now contrast that with when we were able to get the program to a very mature state where it was using, you know, where it's currently using maybe five or four or even 3%. And I'd have to check back now and see where that one's at, but I'm sure it's less than 3% of the, the software development life cycle at the same time, the overall budget for these programs is reducing, uh, you know, somewhere in the nature of 75 to 80%. Um, so if you're going in and talking about the initial hit, um, you can say uh, about 10%. Um, the more automation you can apply, the more checklists, the more things you can basically do to help your developers and your QA people execute accessibility without having to become accessibility experts, the cheaper that hit will be as you become more efficient over time. And as they, as it gets ingrained as just something they do, accessibility by default. Perfect, thanks. Mm -hmm. Another question here. Uh, a lot of good questions, by the yeah, way, that's good. Really yeah. good thanks everybody, mm -hmm. it's great participation. Um, so what is the ROI of hiring um, a SME versus um, training and building an internal SME team? Another great question. So I, if you've gone out and got quotes and you understand what subject matter experts cost when you, when you get them in as consultants. So um, would you need consultants if you've got a large and complex uh, digital presence? 
I think, yeah, you absolutely will. There's, there's such a lift that's provided by experts coming in, especially if you can get them working side by side with your teams in that fashion. The learning curve is immensely affected in a positive way by doing that. So you will need those people. Do you want to outsource accessibility on the long term? Absolutely not. Eventually, you want to get that, that expertise in your team. And so the premium setup here, again, is that if you have a centralized team, you can get experts in that team and perhaps you augment them with, you know, one consultant or a portion of a consultant once you're mature so that you can keep up with what's going on in the industry. What's the new iPhone? What's the new voiceover? You know, whatever developments are happening there. But over time, I would recommend that you build those resources internally. Um, it could be a two or three year journey for you where you're using consultants and you eventually get into the point where you've hired accessibility experts inside your company, but that's always a great investment um, to do that, to get those people there, especially if you can keep them, you know, in your company in long term. I will say that accessibility experts are in high demand um, across the world, and I think will continue to be so, so you could have some problems hiring from that perspective, but you should have a goal to eventually have that internal team, uh, maybe just very lightly supplemented. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Another question here. Um, many corporations lump accessibility in with diversity, uh, most of which um, doesn't actually address uh, digital accessibility. How do we um, address that? And do you, do you believe that this is the right um, stakeholder to own accessibility? I don't think so, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Um, in my personal journey, when I first started working with accessibility years ago, I didn't know what accessibility was, and so I tried to learn it. And I had trouble learning it, and I realized, wait a minute, I need to understand accommodation. So I backed up and understood accommodation, and I was still having trouble, and I thought, well, what do I really need to understand? What I really need to understand was disability. And although I thought I did, I've been active in uh, diversity and inclusion for years and years and years, I didn't. I, I didn't have a clue. Um, and I still learn new things every day. It, it's amazing. But I think when you look at what belongs in diversity and inclusion, it's disability, right? Where accessibility belongs is tied somehow to the technical organization, to IT, to somewhere where they can have an influence over that technology foundation and platform. Um, in, in, there's just, there's, there's nothing I think that'll give you a better lift than that in terms of placement inside of your company. And we've, we've got probably, I don't know, eight or 10 different ways that we've seen people put programs together, you know, hub and spoke or centralized or distributed different ways. Um, but no, I, I think what belongs with DNI is disability, but accessibility because it's so technology dependent really shouldn't be with that same, but there's a differentiation there. I do agree. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We've got time for one last question. Um, regarding social justice, how would you encourage um, the younger generation or just anyone who cares about people with disabilities, um, what would you encourage them to do if they're trying to make that known um, when they see that person with disabilities are blocked from digital spaces? I, I think they should be vocal about it. Um, some of, the, some of the, the other study information that we saw showed that if you were to lose you know, somebody from a family because you weren't accessible uh, for some reason, that you would typically lose that family and some friends and, and maybe some extended friend group as well. So the most important thing is to just be vocal and say, I don't believe that's right. Um, the rest of us have an obligation and a duty to support all of us. And all of us includes people with disabilities. Um, so, when you see someone being treated, someone, anyone being treated, you know, incorrectly because they're part of, of a group, you should speak up and say something about it. I mean, people know how to use social media. Uh, they definitely know how to group and band. Talk about products. Um, say, hey, you know, these are, this, this product is best for people with disabilities. Um, it's what we all should use. You know, influence your friends, influence your family influence the companies through things like Twitter and Facebook and other social media.